Hello, BookTube. Over on Strip Cover Lit, uh, Adrian and Dalton are doing a multi-part read-along of uh, Cormac McCarthy's Pulitzer Prize winning 2006 novel, The Road. And as soon as I learned that, uh, I immediately decided to do a hate-filled counterpoint read-along myself. <laughs> a little impromptu. Uh, and originally I thought that that would be, the stress would be on counterpoint. But I watched their first episode, uh, in which they break down pages 1 to 108, and was reminded again why I love their channel so much, because although they they may at first seem to be the foremost worshippers at the high altar of Dude Bro Lit, given Adrian's unrepentant idolatry of Chuck Palahniuk's novel Fight Club, <laughs> uh, given that fact, it's always a bit surprising to me. I, I'm, I'm always pleased to remember that they're tough critics of everything they read. Uh, including, uh, this is one of the great works, one of the, the, the high holy Bibles of Dude Bro Lit. And, and so a part of me was thinking that my response read-alongs would be countering, or even counteracting, some of the observations that they made throughout. But no, they were refreshingly brutal with the, with, uh, the first 108 pages of this crappy, crappy book. <laughs> Uh, the only, the only small details that I, that I could quibble with, of course, those of you who, who watch Strip Cover Lit will probably agree with me that one of the joys of their channel is quibbling with them. <laughs> probably that's true with every really good interactive booktube channel. Uh, like for instance, uh, I winced, not just my face, but my entire body winced when they had a, a classic millennial moment where they wondered if Krakatoa was in the United States. <laughs> yeah, I'm wincing again just remembering it. <laughs> and the, 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 the subject came up because there, the, there was the question, there's always the question and analysis of this book. This is a, a post-apocalyptic book in which a father and a son are making their way down a road south after a, a cataclysmic event that has left the world in tatters, or at least their, their immediate neighborhood in tatters. Uh, and one of the guessing games throughout, because it's not specified in the book, is what was the event. And they came up with Krakatoa, which I think is located in western Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, as, because what they were trying to figure out, isn't there some enormous volcano in America that's been dormant for a long time, but is, you know, geologically quote-unquote due to erupt? And they are correct. The volcano they were thinking of is the Yellowstone Super Caldera, which is... It absolutely enormously vast, and which is long, long overdue, centuries, millennia overdue, <clears throat> for a massive eruption. And if the Yellowstone Super Caldera were to erupt, not just parts of it, but the whole of it, if the whole of it were to erupt, we actually have geological records of what that was like the last time it happened, and it would wipe out all human life probably everywhere on Earth, but certainly everywhere in North America. There wouldn't be any ability to grow food. There wouldn't be any sunlight. There wouldn't, so there wouldn't soon be any livestock or anything like that. It, 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 the, the, uh, the ejected material would probably cause electronics to, to fail to work. It would be cataclysmic. And uh, some speculation of that kind, volcanic eruptions of some kind, uh, in this book makes more sense, if you want to talk about anything making sense in this book, it makes more sense than, for instance, the, the thing that so many, back in 2006, so many book critics just automatically said it was post-apocalyptic from nuclear warfare. When that, of course, isn't true. <laughs> that could not possibly be true. The, the aftermath of, of nuclear war would not have unirradiated food. It, you wouldn't be able to walk around and still live for years the way our characters do. So uh, I think that, that speculation, regardless of where Krakatoa was located, is probably correct. Another, another quibble that I had also sprang from uh, what I think is sound reasoning. At one point, uh, Adrian says that uh, this book has been fervently embraced by academia, which I wholeheartedly agree with that. He, he made an offhand reference to the fact that, the, that a lot of the people in academia who embraced the book started out life 
wealthy or upper middle class or you know solidly middle class and just became wealthier the implication was that members of academia are wealthy and i think those of you who are in academia will pro are probably laughing right now uh, but i don't I'm, I'm not sure that that was what was on his mind i think probably what was motivating that comment is uh something that adrian and i despite our considerable differences <laughs> absolutely share in common which is a rabid hatred of elitism much like you encounter in academia, in some of the worst parts of academia, where a person thinks, well, the credentials after my name mean that I know better than you do. <laughs> I think on one level, he and I probably agree completely that uh, what you know is what you can show, and what you can show is determined solely by yourself. How much reading have you done? How much work have you done? It has nothing to do with degrees that are or are not after your name, with the classes that you do or do not teach into boredom. <laughs> Uh, but, but aside from little quibbles, I mostly agreed with most of the criticism that they had of this crappy, crappy book. <laughs> it starts off, uh, the reason that we're speculating about the nature of the disaster is because we don't know. Because we're never told. Uh, it starts off with a grown man and his son. They are called the man and the boy. And there's no reason for that. There's no reason why we don't know the nature of the disaster, because, as Dalton and Adrian point out, the man certainly knows what happened. And it's not like we are not privy to his thoughts. The very first thing we get about him is a detailed narration of a dream he was having. We are deep inside him. The, the narration has no, is no stranger to this person. It knows everything there is to know about him. So it knows that he knows his own name, and it also knows that he knows the name of the boy. And whether or not he ever, in the course of their perambulations down this road with their shopping cart and their scavenged their scavenge supplies, ever has occasion to say the boy's name, which of course he would. <laughs> he absolutely would. It's just natural. Even if he had no occasion to say that name, he would certainly think it. Uh, and he doesn't. He doesn't ever think it. We do, the, the, the man and the boy are never identified. And the man never talks about, never thinks about, why they're on the road. He never thinks about the nature of the disaster. It happened years ago, uh, so not so many years that he doesn't remember it, but so many years that the boy doesn't remember it. His mother died of suicide uh, after, shortly after giving birth to him, so he doesn't remember the world before this catastrophe, except for the times when he does, when Cormac McCarthy forgets that the boy doesn't remember that his whole world is this world. And that that wouldn't work. <laughs> that absolutely wouldn't work. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, they're traveling south uh, because the man has decided uh, that that they should at least have the elements on their side, and that if they're in what what seems to be the Pacific Northwest, uh, they'll freeze to death in the winter. So they're heading south with their shopping cart. They have a gun with two rounds in it. There are two of them, and they have two rounds in the gun. Uh, and they're scavenging as they go along. They're all, they're very thin. The, the, the man is sick, he's coughing, and his cough is getting worse. Uh, and all he's trying to do is get down south to the coast. He doesn't give a reason for that. Uh, and the, that is it. That the, the reason why Adrian and Dalton seem to fumble a bit when they never do in the course of their recap videos, their, their literature analysis videos are fantastic, and they never stumble when it comes to the plot. The reason why they seem to stumble here is not because of their fault, it's because the book has no plot. That is it. What I just said to you is the plot. A, a man and a boy on a road, and then things happen to them. There's no arc, there's no resolution, there's no nothing. Uh, I, I have many, many thoughts on that being integral to the appeal of Dude Bro Lit, but we'll save those for another video. Uh, so, all we get to talk about here, since we're not talking about the organic progression of the plot, all we talk about is what happens next. And there are a couple of things that I wanted to mention in this, what I thought was going to be a counterpoint read-along, but actually it's just that Adrian and Dalton and I, the three strip cover lit guys, are all equally, in slightly different ways, unimpressed with this book. I think I hate it more than they do. Uh, but maybe that's because I have, in my life, encountered more people who venerate this kind of garbage than they have. One way or another, or maybe I'm just <clears throat> Irish Catholic enough to be more prone to hate. <laughs> one, one way or another. Uh, the man and the boy have two main obstacles 
in the course of the 108 pages that we see here, there are two main omnipresent obstacles are one to get enough food, uh, when actually their main concern would be to get enough water. But the, the, <laughs> the guys also point that out, leave that aside to, to find enough food because everything has been blasted. There's dust and whirlwinds of ash everywhere. There are no, there are no crops. There are no stores. There are no people. There is no traffic. The world has ended. They are uh, effectively alone most of the time. That's obstacle number one, and obstacle number two is uh, to avoid the bad guys. They, they, they simplistically refer to themselves as the good guys throughout. And because they do, I guess we're supposed to believe it. Uh, but it, it, it's supposed to be self-evident. It isn't self-evident to me, but it's supposed to be. And the, the world is full of bad guys. And we see them. Even in these first 108 pages, we see them. We see... For instance, a locked house in which, in the basement, there are a group of helpless, naked people who are slowly being consumed by cannibals, by a group of cannibals, uh, who come in, hack off a limb, cauterize it, take the limb, feed themselves, and it's essentially a live larder. The man and the boy encounter this larder. They don't set the people free. They could. They don't. They instead uh, just leave. Uh, and at another point, they are they are on the road when they hear a diesel. They hear a, a, a automated we, a, a, an automobile of some kind coming. They take shelter underneath the road, and a lorry comes by with a crew of men on it. Uh, and the lorry's in terrible shape; it's just chugging along just barely. And the man and the, the man and the boy decide to hide, of course, because they don't trust these people. Uh, and in both those cases. The, the man and the boy are in the larder house when they look out the window and see a group of people coming towards the house. And they have to flee out the back, out the front way. Uh, the same thing is true with the, with the lorry and its crew of armed men. In both cases, uh, we see something that Cormac McCarthy just extends his hand into the narrative and does. He doesn't make it organic any more than he's made anything else in this crappy, crappy book organic. He just does it to make it happen. And the, the thing is the same in both cases. In both cases, he simply saves his protagonists. Just hack ex machina. He just saves them. He intervenes in the narrative and saves them. After having carefully described the way they could not possibly have been saved without him. In the larder house, the man, as he and the boy are running along the driveway away from the house, the man himself points out, in his thoughts, in his frenzied thoughts, that there's no way that, that the people approaching the house won't see them. Just, there's just no way that it won't happen. They're running essentially in the open, and yet they are not seen, and they are not pursued, even though the man, the, the people who are approaching the larder house are obviously approaching the house in order to check on the food. And the food is human, just like they are. <laughs> it's not livestock. It's human, just like they are. Which means as soon as they open the door to that cellar, they're going to be told that two people were just there. A second ago. <laughs> Seconds ago. In other words, a search for more food. And they don't do it. There's, it's never even hinted at. Same thing is true in the second case. With the, uh, the, the truck and all the people on it. When the man and the boy are down hiding, one of the people from that truck uh, leaves the others and comes down the escarpment and is on level ground with them, I guess, to urinate. I assume, to, to urinate, I assume he has a reason to be leaving the others. Uh, and the man has to pull a gun on him and tell him, you know, we're going to walk with you just a ways down the road here. That's all the head start we need, and then we'll let you go. And if you don't do that, I'm going to kill you. Uh, and the the uh, guy from the truck doesn't believe it uh, and says, I don't think you're going to shoot me. And somehow, from a standing start, 30 feet away, manages to grab the boy who's right next to the man. <laughs> Somehow that manages to happen. Cormac McCarthy tells us that the guy is big, but surprisingly fast. Yeah, he certainly is. <laughs> he certainly is. One might even say unbelievably fast. Sooner, But in a second, he has the boy, you know, by the throat, holding him in front of him. Classic Hollywood standoff. And uh, the man ducks and rolls, comes up into a kneeling position, puts the gun in a two-handed position, and shoots the guy from the truck in the forehead, killing him instantly. 
and he grabs the boy, and we are told two things. One, we're told that they are 20 feet away from the crew on the truck when this happens. And two, we're told that once he fires the gun, which in a silent world must have been like a clap of doom, once he does that, the man picks up the boy and runs along the road. <laughs> he runs along down the road. In other words, not only would the crew on the truck have immediately heard a gun going off, but they would then immediately see who had killed their comrade and give chase. <laughs> and instead, they're never mentioned again. It's, it, it, nothing like that even happens. The thought goes right out of Cormac McCarthy's mind because he's already done the only thing that matters to him. He has saved his protagonist, and in the meantime, given us a badass moment that would never in a million years happen <laughs> the way it happens. Uh, and there's one other way. Those, those are the two ways that Cormac McCarthy intervenes in this narrative just brute, by brute force to save his protagonist from a world that is apparently crawling with cannibals, including some cannibals who aren't just scavengers. They have an extensive bureaucratic network. It's one thing if you have a larder of live food and you occasionally come in and brutalize it. But at one point, we see the, the man and the boy see a, a platoon of people marching in unison, in as close as they can come to matching uniforms, matching sneakers, red bandanas around their necks, bringing after them uh, captives and a harem of slave women. <laughs> in other words, an extensively developed bureaucracy of leaders, sub-leaders, and, and followers who, who apparently drill. Uh, they must have spare time to drill, to work in unison. And, and that doesn't make any sense at all because the only way that you have spare time and steady routine to drill in place to become a militia that has matching uniforms is if you have a steady su supply of food. And that only happens with agriculture. And these people don't have agriculture. There is no agriculture. So it, the only reason that detail is in this book is because Cormac McCarthy is familiar enough with bad, hackneyed, post-apocalyptic science fiction to know that there are going to be cannibals. There have to be cannibals. There's not going to be anything other than that. And that th they will work in unison like something out of Mad Max. <sighs> But the only other time that he intervenes directly in this world that's, uh, that's fraught with bad guys, apparently nobody else decides in these first 108 pages to do the right thing and not eat people, uh, to, to be willing to starve to death in order to not eat people, which is the willingness that the man has for both himself and his son. The, the son says, are we going to eat people? And the man says, no, we're not. apparently meaning for us to know that he means that to be true even if it's that or the boy starves to death and they come close to starving to death that is the other way that Cormac McCarthy simply reaches into this narrative and saves his protagonist they are on the verge of starving to death they have not found any useful food the man calculates that it isn't long now it won't be long until their bodies get to the point where you can't come back that that does happen with starving people. You get to the point where you can't come back unless you were to fall face first onto an operating table with with doctors and IVs and all sorts of stuff like that. Otherwise, no. And he knows, the man knows that, it, that soon, someday, real soon, in a matter of days, they're going to reach that point because there's nothing to eat. And right at that moment, Cormac McCarthy enters the story to provide them with a previously undiscovered cellar full of provisions. Full of provisions bottled water and a chemical toilet and peaches galore and all sorts of other things. Just a, a bounty of supplies that they find. It's been years. It's pretty clear from their previous adventures that every inch of ground has been scoured by people going one way or another. Somehow no one managed to find this place and somehow the person or people who built it and stocked it didn't bother to use it when the end was nigh. <laughs> One way or another, it's, it's so annoying, it's so amateurish, that if a student at a writing workshop wrote these first 108 pages, they'd be called up short a million different ways, on a million different grounds, not just the deus ex machina point, but also the writing, which is the last thing I want to mention here in these first 108 pages. The writing here is just unbearable. It's, it's just, just unbearable. It has Cormac McCarthy gimmicks, uh, that don't make any sense. There are no 
quotation marks around spoken dialogue in this book. There are also no apostrophes. There are no contractions in this book. The contractions exist. Don't, can't, won't. But not the apostrophe. Instead, it's just the, the letters. Without any indication that the word not is being contracted. And without any explanation, or even hint of an explanation as to why that would be. It, the, the only explanation that you can possibly come up with when you're reading along and you notice that, because of course you're going to notice that. Of course that's going to take you out of the story. You're going to notice that this thing is not properly punctuated. <laughs> and the only possible explanation for that, this is not, uh, this, this text that we're reading is not, for instance, a rediscovered text from centuries after the adventures of this man and boy, where there you could have an explanation within the story. Instead, the only explanation you can come up with for why this book orthographically is the way it is is because Cormac McCarthy himself, the author, doesn't like writing those things. So every single page, on every single page, literally in every paragraph, you are reminded that this is a book written by Cormac McCarthy who doesn't like apostrophes. <laughs> If there is anything less organic than that, if there's anything more guaranteed to pull you out of the story than that, I was going to say, if there's anything more guaranteed to pull you out of the story than that, I don't know what it is, but that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. Actually, the prose will pull you out of the story every single time. Every single time. Now, I could give you a million quotes. I'm going to give you two. But I could give you a million quotes of just how bad this is. Just how bad it is. Adrian refers to it as pretentious prose. He's absolutely right. Adrian and Dalton both hint at how overwrought, how overdone this is. Pointlessly so. And they're right. If this were done in the mind frame, in the limited persona of the man, well, we don't know anything about him, so it could be that he's a histrionic git. That could be true. And then you might be able to say, well, okay, it's unbearable to read, but at least it doesn't, it isn't nonsensical. But we're not getting this. We're getting this from someone else, not from the man. This is not from his point of view, except when he's remembering things. And you're going to see, that doesn't help any. Uh, so this is the first one that I want to read you. It's, it's awful, uh, so brace yourself. <laughs> In those first years, this I guess means those first years after whatever happened. Uh, after whatever the catastrophe was. In those first years, the roads were peopled with refugees shrouded up in their clothing, wearing masks and goggles, sitting in their rags by the side of the road like ruined aviators. Their barrows heaped with shoddy. Shoddy is an adjective, not a noun, but that's okay. Uh, towing wagons or carts. I guess their barrows are towing wagons or carts. Uh, their eyes bright in their skulls. Creedless shells of men tottering down the causeways like migrants in a fever land. The frailty of everything revealed at last. Old and troubling issues resolved into nothingness and night. The last instance of a thing takes the class with it. Turns out the lights and is gone. Look around you. Ever is a long time. But the boy knew what he knew. That ever is no time at all. Of course, the silver bullet garlic to the vampire question at the end of a paragraph of flapdoodle like that is, what the hell does that mean? And the reason that's a silver bullet question is because nobody knows. Cormac McCarthy doesn't know. Certainly none of that was thought by the boy. <laughs> it seems barely literate at all. Instead, it's just highfalutin. That's all. It's just highfalutin. We're going to talk about Dude Bro Lit later on. But one of the tricks, one of the gimmicks, the signature gimmicks of Dude Bro Lit is to itemize the items in your pocket and then talk about the glory of God right then. Not another sentence, not a different paragraph, but, you know, I've got this old butterscotch candy. Don't know if I'm ever going to get around to eating it. And then there's my pocket watch. And it has, And then I've got this, this switchblade, but I really do need to fix the hinge on it because really aren't we all hinges in the universe that God created and then abandoned? That kind of gimmick is signature for Dude Bro Lit. It does not exist without it. And I, I'll, I'll mention later on down this road, I will mention where it comes from. It's easy to diagnose where it comes from and that it's just being done poorly here. Uh, but the, the, uh, the other example of horrendous writing that I want to give you also touches on another characteristic, a signature hallmark characteristic of Dude Bro Lit. Uh, this is the man remembering his wife who I guess we'll call the woman. <laughs> it's even in his memories of her, he does not remember her name. Does not think her name. Uh, although we know he knows her name. Because at one point we're told that he says her name, we just don't hear it. Uh, but anyway, uh, he tells her, I can't do this alone. Meaning, 
you know, live with you and uh, go on without you and the boy, uh, then don't. I can't help you. you. They say that women dream of danger to those in their care and men dream of danger to themselves. But I don't dream at all. You say you can't? Then don't do it, that's all, because I am done with my own whorish heart, and I have been for a long time. You talk about taking a stand, but there is no stand to take. My heart was ripped out of me the night he was born, so don't ask for sorrow now. There is none. Maybe you'll be good at this. I doubt it, but who knows? The one thing I can tell you is that you won't survive for yourself. I know because I would never have come this far. A person who had no one would be well advised to cobble together some passable ghost, breathe it into being and coax it along with words of love, offer it each phantom crumb and shield it from harm with your body. As for me, my only hope is for eternal nothingness, and I hope it with all my heart. <sighs> That's when you know that you're in fantasy land. No one talks that way. Not even in the direst moment of crisis, no one talks that way. And that is also a perfect example, if you didn't get it, if it wasn't tipped off by my whorish heart, that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about here. Another absolute hallmark of Dude Bro Lit is its absolute genetic level misogyny. There are never any meaningful female characters. And the characters, the female characters who are dragged on stage are just like that. Just exactly like that. The, the, the woman is the boy's mother, but she says she has a whorish heart and she doesn't care and she's going to kill herself. You can take care of the boy or not. He's my son, but I don't care. Because, you know, chicks. <sighs> and that is where we get to the end of what I thought was going to be a hate read along. But instead, what it's going to amount to is Adrian, Dalton, and I bare knuckle beating up on this book for the rest of the month <laughs> and considering the incredible reverence that has been loaded on this thing it deeply deserves it this did not deserve its pulitzer prize and i agree with adrian when he implies that the reason for a large amount of the plots that have been given to this book is that the people who are doing it think that it's hands-off literature they think okay well I don't know, I've never read any science fiction, I've never read any post-apocalyptic fiction. If you asked me to name a post-apocalyptic novel, a genuine one, one where the world building was actually worked out ahead of time, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't name On the Beach or uh, Alas Babylon or anything like that. I couldn't do it. I couldn't name a legitimate work of post-apocalyptic fiction because this is the only one I've ever read. I don't read science fiction. I don't like ray guns. <sighs> but anyway. So there you go. Uh, this was unexpected. Uh, this is another read-along <laughs> of a kind. So uh, when the guys kick up, I will leave a link to their video down below. You have to watch it. You just have to. And if you go to their video, if you follow that link and you go to their video and you find that you're not subscribed, subscribe. Because keep in mind, unlike me and uh, most of the rest of us on BookTube, Adrian and Dalton actually want to make a going concern of their channel. And they put so much work into it that we should help them to do that. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, uh, subscriptions help. Uh, but anyway, one way or another, they are going to, to reconvene next week to do the next 100 pages of The Road, and so will I. <laughs> we will see what we will see. <laughs> In the meantime, I'll wrap this up, but I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.